Public Library Twitch channel. My name is Anne. I'm Megan. And this is another edition of Lunchtime Listens, The Hobbit. So I was not here last week. So Megan, what happened? Well, after a very perilous, dirty, and uncomfortable journey in some barrels, Bill will, uh, you know, undog all the dwarves from the barrels, <laughs> and as they washed ashore of Lake Town, mm -hmm. there they partied and ate and recovered for a few weeks, and before they overstayed their welcome, they got out of there. Uh, the next chapter, they climbed the mountain, and they found the door, nice. and they finally opened the door. Since Christina didn't ask you last week, you have read The Hobbit, right? Yes. How long ago was it that you read it? I want to say like 2010. Okay, so it's okay. been a while. It's been like over a decade. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and we're going to try to get through chapters 12 and 13 today. You ready? Yeah, let's do okay. it. Let's do it. Chapter 12 Inside Information. For a long time, the dwarves stood in the dark before the door and debated, until at last Thorin spoke. Now is the time for our esteemed Mr. Baggins, who has proved himself a good companion on our long road, and a hobbit full of courage and resource far exceeding his size and, if I may say so, possessed of good luck far exceeding the usual allowance. Now is the time for him to perform the service for which he was included in our company. Now is the time for him to earn his reward. Reward is capitalized. Capital R, reward. That's important. <laughs> you are familiar with Thorin's style on important occasions, so I will not give you any more of it, though he went on a good deal longer than this. It certainly was an important occasion, but Bilbo felt impatient. By now, he's quite familiar with Thorin, too, and he knew what he was driving at. If you mean you think it is my job to go into the secret passage first, or, oh, Thorin, Thrain's son, Oak and Shield, may your beard grow ever longer, he said crossly, say so at once and have done. I might refuse. I have got you out of two messes already, which was hardly in the original bargain, so that I am, I think, already owed some reward. But third time pays for all, as my father used to say, and somehow I don't think I shall refuse. Perhaps I have begun to trust my luck more than I used to in the old days. But anyway, I think I will go and have a peep at once and get it over. Now who is coming with me? He did not expect a chorus of volunteers, so he was not disappointed. <laughs> Feely and Keely looked uncomfortable and stood on one leg, but the others made no pretense of offering, except old Balin, the lookout man, who was rather fond of the Hobbit. He said he would come inside at least, and perhaps a bit of the way too, ready to call for help if necessary. The most that can be said for the dwarves is this. They intended to pay Bilbo really handsomely for his services. They had brought him to do a nasty job for them, and they did not mind the poor little fellow doing it if he would, but they would all have done their best to get him out of trouble if he got into it as they did in the case of the trolls at the beginning of their adventures, before they had any particular reasons for being grateful to him. There it is. Dwarves are not heroes, but calculating folk with a great idea of the value of money. Some are tricky and treacherous and pretty bad lots. Some are not, but are decent enough people like Thorin and company who don't expect too much. The stars were coming out behind him in a pale sky marred with black when the hobbit crept through the enchanted door and stole into the mountain. It was far easier going than he expected. This was no goblin entrance or rough wood elves cave, it was a passage made by dwarves at the height of their wealth and skill, straight as a ruler, smooth floored and smooth sided, going with a gentle, never varying slope direct to some distant end of the blackness below. After a while, Balin bade Bilbo good luck and stopped where he could still see the faint outline of the door and by a trick of the echoes of the tunnel, hear the rustle of the whispering voices of the others just outside. Then the hobbit slipped on his ring and warned by the echoes to take more than hobbits care to make no sound, he crept noiselessly down, down, down into the dark. He was trembling with fear, but his little face was set and grim. Already he was a very different hobbit from the one that had run out without a pocket handkerchief from Baggin long ago. He had not had a pocket handkerchief for ages. He loosened his dagger in his sheath, tightened his belt, and went off. Now you're in for it at last, Bilbo Baggins, he said to himself. You went and put your foot right in it that night of the party, and now you've got to pull it out and pay for it. Dear me, what a fool I was and am, said the least tookish part of him. I have absolutely no use for dragon garment treasures, and the whole lot could stay here forever if only I could wake up and find this beastly tunnel as my own front hall at home. He did not wake up, of course, but went still on and on until all sign of the door behind him faded away. He was altogether alone. Soon he thought it was beginning to feel warm. Is that a kind of glow I seem to see coming right down ahead, ahead down there, he thought? It was. <laughs> As he went forward, it grew and grew till there was no doubt about it. It was a red light, steadily getting redder and redder. Also, it was now undoubtedly hot in the tunnel. Wisps of vapor floated up and passed him and he began to sweat. A sound too began to throb in his ears a sort of bubbling like the noise of a large pot galloping on the fire, mixed with the rumble as of a giant tomcat purring. 
This grew to the unmistakable gurgling noise of some vast animal snoring in its sleep down there in the red glow in front of him. It was at this point that Bilbo stopped. Going on from there was the bravest thing he ever did. The tremendous things that happened afterwards were as nothing compared to it. He fought the real battle in the tunnel alone before he ever saw the vast danger that lay in wait. At any rate, after a short halt go on, he did. And you can picture him coming to the end of the tunnel, an opening of much the same size and shape as the door above. Through it peeps the hobbit's little head. Before him lies the great bottommost cellar or dungeon hall of the ancient dwarves right at the mountain's root. It is almost dark so that its vastness can only be dimly guessed, but rising from the near side of the rocky floor, there is a great glow, the glow of smog. There he lay, a vast red golden dragon, fast asleep. A thrumming came from his jaws and nostrils and wisps of smoke, but his fires were low in slumber. Beneath him, under all his limbs and his huge coiled tail, and about him on all sides, stretching away across the unseen floors, lay countless piles of precious things, gold wrought and unwrought, gems and jewels and silver red stained in the ruddy light. Smog lay, with wings folded like an immeasurable bat, turned partly on one side, so that the hobbit could see his underparts and his long pale belly, crusted with gems and fragments of gold from his long lying on his costly bed. Behind him, where the walls were nearest, could dimly be seen coats of mail, helms and axes, swords and spears hanging, and there in rows stood great jars and vessels filled with a wealth that could not be guessed. To say that Bilbo's breath was taken away is no description at all. There are no words left to express his staggerment, since men changed the language that they learned of elves in the days when all the world was wonderful. Bilbo had heard tell and sing of dragon hordes before, but the splendor, the lust, the glory of such treasure had never yet come home to him. His heart was filled and pierced with enchantment and with the desire of dwarves, and he gazed motionless, almost forgetting the frightful guardian at the gold beyond price and count. He gazed for what seemed an age, before drawn almost against his will, he stole from the shadow of the doorway, across the floor to the nearest edge of the mound of treasure. Above him the sleeping dragon lay, a dire menace even in his sleep, he grasped a great two-handled cup, as heavy as he could carry, and cast one fearful eye upward. Smog stirred a wing, opened a claw. The rumble of his snoring changed its note. Then Bilbo fled. But the dragon did not wake, not yet, but shifted into other dreams of greed and violence, lying there in his stolen hall while the little hobbit toiled back up the long tunnel. His heart was beating, and a more fevered shaking was in his legs than when he was going down, but still he clutched the cup and his chief thought was, I've done it, this will show them, more like a grocer than a burglar indeed. Well, we'll hear no more of that, nor did he. Balin was overjoyed to see the hobbit again and as delighted as he was surprised. He picked Bilbo up and carried him out into the open air. It was midnight and clouds had covered the stars, but Bilbo lay with his eyes shut, gasping and taking pleasure in the field of fresh air again and hardly noticing the excitement of the dwarves or how they praised him and patted him on the back and put themselves and all their families for generations to come at the surface. The dwarves were still passing the cup from hand to hand and talking delightedly of the recovery of their treasure when suddenly a vast rumbling woke in the mountain underneath as if it was an old volcano that had made up its mind to start eruptions once again. The door behind them was pulled nearly to and blocked from closing with a stone, but up the long tunnel came the dreadful echoes from far down the depths of a bellowing and a trampling that made the ground beneath them tremble. Then the dwarves forgot their joy and their confident boasts of a moment before and cowered down in fright. Smog was still to be reckoned with. It does not do to leave a live dragon out of your calculations. Honestly, a very important life lesson. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it does not do to leave a live dragon out of your calculations if you live near him. <laughs> <laughs> or want to steal from him. Yeah, seriously. Like, you think they don't know? Dragons may not have much real use for all their wealth, but they know it to an ounce as a rule, especially after long possession, and Smog was no exception. He had passed from an uneasy dream in which a warrior, altogether insignificant in size, but provided with a bitter sword and great courage, figured most unpleasantly, to a doze from a doze to wide waking. There was a breath of strange air in his cave. Could there be a draft in that little hole? He had never felt quite happy about it, though it was so small, and now he glared at it in suspicion and wondered why he had never locked it up. 
Of late, he had half fancied he had caught the dim echoes of a knocking sound from far above that came down through it to his lair. He stirred and stretched forth his neck to sniff. Then he missed the cop. Thieves, fire, murder! Such a thing had not happened since first he came to the mountain. His rage passes description. The sort of rage that is only seen when rich folk that have more than they can enjoy suddenly lose something that they have long had but never before wanted or used. His fire belched forth. The hall smoked. He shook the mountain roots. He thrust his head in vain at the little hole, and then coiling his length together, roaring like thunder underground, he sped from his deep lair through its great door, out on into the huge passages of the mountain palace and up towards the front gate. To hunt the whole mountain till he caught the thief and had torn and trampled him was his one thought. He issued from the gate, the waters rose in fierce whistling steam, and up he soared, blazing into the air, and settled on the mountain top in a spout of green and scarlet flame. The dwarves heard the awful rumor of his flight, and they crouched against the walls of the grassy terrace, cringing under boulders, hoping somehow to escape the frightful eyes of a hunting dragon. There they would have all been killed if it had not been for Bilbo once again. Quick, quick, he gasped, the door, the tunnel, it's no good here. Roused by these words, they were just about to creep inside the tunnel when Biffer gave a cry. My cousins, Bomber and Boffer, we've forgotten them. They're down in the valley. They will be slain and all our ponies, too, and all our stores lost, moaned the others. We can do nothing. Nonsense, said Thorin, recovering his dignity. We cannot leave them. Get inside, Mr. Baggins and Valin, and you too, Feely and Keely. Dragons shan't have all of us. Now you others, where are the ropes? Be quick. Those were perhaps the worst moments they had been through yet. The horrible sounds of Smog's anger were echoing in the stony halls far above. At any moment, he might come blazing down or fly whirling round and find them there near the perilous cliff's edge, hauling madly up on, on the ropes. Up came Boffer, and still all was safe. Up came Bomber, puffing and blowing while the ropes creaked, and still all was safe. Up came some tools and bundles of stores, and then danger was upon them. A whirring noise was heard. A red light touched the points of standing rocks. The dragon came. They had barely time to fly back to the tunnel, pulling and dragging in their bundles, when Smog came hurtling from the north, licking the mountain sides with flame, beating his great wings with a noise like a roaring wind. His hot breath shriveled the grass before the door and drove in through the crack they had left and scorched them as they lay hid. Flickering fires leaped up and black rock shadows danced. Then darkness fell as he passed again. The ponies screamed with terror, burst their ropes, and galloped wildly off. The dragon swooped and turned to pursue them and was gone. That'll be the end of our poor beast, said Thorin. Nothing can escape Smog once he sees it. Here we are, and here we shall have to stay, unless anyone fancies tramping the long open miles back to the river with Smog on the watch. It was not a pleasant thought. They crept further down in the tunnel, and there they lay and shivered, though it was warm and stuffy, until dawn came pale through the crack of the door. Every now and again through the night, they could hear the roar of a flying dragon grow and then pass and fade as he hunted round and round the mountainsides. He guessed from the ponies and from the traces of the camps he had discovered that men had come up from the river and the lake and had scaled the mountainside from the valley where the ponies had been standing. But the door withstood his searching eye and the little high-walled bay had kept out his fiercest flames. Long he had hunted in vain, till the dawn chilled his wrath and he went back to his golden couch to sleep and to gather new strength. He would not forget or forgive the theft, not if a thousand years turned him to smoldering stone, but he could afford to wait. Slow and silent, he crept back to his lair and half closed his eyes. When morning came, the terror of the dwarves grew less. They realized that dangers of this kind were inevitable in dealing with such a guardian and that it was no good giving up their quest yet. Nor could they get away just now, as Thorin had pointed out. Their ponies were lost or killed, and they would have to wait some time before Smog relaxed his watch sufficiently for them to dare the long way on foot. Luckily, they had saved enough of their stores to last them still for some time. They debated long on what was to be done, but they could think of no way of getting rid of Smog, which had always been a weak point in their plans, as Bilbo felt inclined to point out. <laughs> Then, as is the nature of folk that are thoroughly perplexed, they began to grumble at the hobbit, blaming him for what had first, at first so pleased them, for bringing away a cup and stirring up Smog's wrath too soon. 
What else do you suppose a burglar is to do? asked Bilbo angrily. I was not engaged to kill dragons. That is warrior's work, but to steal treasure. I made the best beginning I could. Did you expect me to trot back with a whole horde of Thror on my back? If there is any grumbling to be done, I think I might have a say. You ought to have brought 500 burglars, not one. I am sure it reflects great credit on your grandfather, but you cannot pretend that you ever made the vast extent of his wealth clear to me. I should want hundreds of years to bring it all up if I was fifty times as big and smog as tame as a rabbit. After that, of course, the dwarves begged his pardon. What then do you propose we should do, Mr. Baggins? asked Thorin politely. I have no idea at the moment, if you mean about removing the treasure. That obviously depends entirely on some new turn of luck and the getting rid of smog. Getting rid of dragons is not at all in my line, but I will do my best to think about it. Personally, I have no hopes at all, and I wish I was safe back at home. Never mind that for the moment. What are we to do now, today? Well, if you really want my advice, I should say we can do nothing but stay where we are. By day, we can no doubt creep out safely enough to take the air. Perhaps before long, one or two can be, could be chosen to go back to the store by the river and replenish our supplies. But in the meanwhile, everyone ought to be well inside the tunnel by night. Now I will make you an offer. I have got my ring and will creep down at this very noon. Then, if ever Smog ought to be napping, and see what he is up to. Perhaps something will turn up. Every worm has his weak spot, as my father used to say, though I am sure it was not from personal experience. Naturally, the dwarves accepted this offer eagerly. Already they had come to respect little Bilbo. Now he had become the real leader in their adventure. He had begun to have ideas and plans of his own. When midday came, he got ready for another journey down into the mountain. He did not like it, of course, but it was not so bad now he knew more or less what was in front of him. Had he known more about dragons and their wily ways, he might have been more frightened and less hopeful of catching this one napping. The sun was shining when he started, but it was as dark as night in the tunnel. The light from the door, almost closed, soon faded as he went down. So silent was his going that smoke on a gentle wind could hardly have surpassed it, and he was inclined to feel a bit proud of himself as he drew near the lower door. There was only the very faintest glow to be seen. Old Smog is weary and asleep, he thought. He can't see me and he won't hear me. Cheer up, Bilbo. He had forgotten or had never heard about Dragon's sense of smell. Bilbo, come on. Yeah, seriously, Bilbo. <laughs> it is also an awkward fact that they can keep half an eye open watching while they sleep if they are suspicious. Dragons are cats confirmed. Yes. Also, like, I do imagine, you know Smog is a bad guy. But I do imagine, like, the, the sleeping pose is like a cat going like this, you know? <laughs> we know Smog is a bad guy, but he's still a cat. So we have... I mean, although all cats have some evil in them. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, Smog certainly looked fast asleep, almost dead and dark, which scarce, with scarcely a snore more than a whiff of unseen steam, when Bilbo peeped once more from the entrance. He was just about to step out onto the floor when he caught a sudden thin and piercing ray of red from under the drooping lid of Smog's left eye. He was only pretending to sleep. He was watching the tunnel entrance. Hurriedly, Bilbo stepped back and blessed the luck of his ring. Then Smog spoke. Oh. Well, thief, I smell you and I feel your air. I hear your breath. Come along, help yourself again. There's plenty in despair. But Bilbo was not quite so unlearned in dragon lore as all that, and if Smog hoped to get him to come near so easily, he was disappointed. No thank you, O oh Smog the Tremendous, he replied. I did not come for a presence. I only wished to have a look at you and see if you were truly as great as tales say. I did not believe them. Do you now? said the dragon, somewhat flattered, even though he did not believe a word of it. Truly, songs and tales fall utterly short of the reality. O oh, Smog, the chiefest and greatest of calamities, replied Bilbo. You have nice manners for a thief and a liar, said the dragon. You seem familiar with my name, but I don't seem to remember smelling you before. Who are you and where do you come from, may I ask? You may indeed. I come from Underhill, and under the hills and over the hills my paths led. And through the air, I am he that walks unseen. So I can well believe, said Smog. But that is hardly your usual name. I am the clue finder, the web car, the stinging fly. I was chosen for the lucky number. Lovely titles, sneered the dragon, but lucky numbers don't always come off. I am he that buries his friends alive and drowns them and draws them again alive from the water. I came from the end of a bag and no bag, but no bag went over me. Those don't sound so creatable, creditable, scoffed Smog. 
I am the friend of bears and the guest of eagles. I am ring winner and luck wearer and I am barrel rider, went on Bilbo, beginning to be pleased with his riddling. That's better, said Smog. Don't let your imagination run away with you. This, of course, is the way to talk to dragons if you don't want to reveal your property, which is wise, and don't want to infuriate them by a flat refusal, which is also very wise. No dragon can resist the fascination of riddling talk and of wasting time trying to understand it. There was a lot here which Smog did not understand at all, though I expect you to, since you know all about Bilbo's adventures to which he was referring. But he thought he understood enough, and he chuckled in his wicked inside. I thought so last night, he smiled to himself. Lake men, some nasty scheme of those miserable tub trading lake men, or I'm a lizard. I haven't been down that way for an age and an age, but I will soon after that. Very well, O Barrel Rider, he said aloud. Maybe Barrel was your pony's name, maybe not, though it was fat enough. You may walk unseen, but you did not walk all the way. Let me tell you, I ate six ponies last night and I shall catch and eat all the others before long. In return for the excellent meal, I will give you one piece of advice for your good. Don't have more to do with dwarves than you can help. Dwarves, said Bilbo in pretend surprise. Don't talk to me, said Smog. I know the smell and taste of dwarf, no one better. Don't tell me I can eat a dwarf ridden pony and not know it. You'll come to a bad end if you go with such friends, thief barrel rider. I don't mind if you go back and tell them so from me. But he did not tell Bilbo that there was one smell he could not make out at all. Hobbit smell. It was quite outside his experience and puzzled him mightily. I suppose you got a fair price for that cup last night, he went on. Come now, did you? Nothing at all? Well, that's just like them. And I suppose they're skulking outside. Your job is to do all the dangerous work and get what you can when I'm not looking for them. And you will get a fair share. Don't you believe it? If you get off alive, you'll be lucky. Bilbo was now beginning to feel really uncomfortable. <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> Whenever Smog's roving eye seeking for him in the shadows flashed across him, he trembled, and an unaccountable desire seized hold of him to rush out and reveal himself and tell all the truth to Smog. In fact, he was in grievous danger of coming under the dragon's spell. But plucking up courage, he spoke again. You don't know everything, O oh Smog the Mighty, he said. Not gold alone brought us hither. Ha ha, you admit the us, laughed Smog. Why not say us fourteen and be done with it, Mr. Lucky Number? I am pleased to hear that you had other business in these parts besides my gold. In that case, you may perhaps not altogether waste your time. I don't know if it has occurred to you that even if you could steal gold bit by bit, a matter of a hundred years or so, you could not get it very far. Not much use on the mountainside, not much use in the forest. Bless me, had you never thought of the catch? A 14th share, I suppose, or something like that. Those were the terms, eh? But what about delivery? What about cartage? What about armed guards and, and tolls? And Smog laughed aloud. He had a wicked and wily heart, and he knew his guesses were not far out, though he suspected that the lake men were at the back of the plans and that most of the plunder was meant to stop there in the town by the shore that in his young days had been called Esgaroth. You will hardly believe it, but poor Bilbo was really very taken aback. So far, all his thoughts and energies had been concentrated on getting to the mountain and finding the entrance. He had never bothered to wonder how the treasure was to be removed, certainly never how any part of that might fall to his share was to be brought back all the way to Bag End Thunder Hill. Now a nasty suspicion began to grow in his mind. Had the dwarves forgotten this important point, point too? Or were they laughing in their sleeves at him all that time? That was the effect that Dragon Talk has on the unexperienced. Bilbo, of course, ought to have been on his guard, but Smog had rather an overwhelming personality. I tell you, he said in an effort to remain loyal to his friends and to keep his end up, that gold was only an afterthought with us. We came over hill and under hill by wave and wind for revenge. Surely, O oh Smog, the unassessably wealthy, you must realize that your success has made you some bitter enemies. Then Smog really did laugh, a devastating sound which shook Bilbo to the floor, while far up in the tunnel the dwarves huddled together and imagined that the hobbit had come to a sudden and nasty end. Revenge, he snorted, and the light in his eyes lit the hall from floor to ceiling like scarlet lightning. Revenge? The king under the mountain is dead, and where are his kin that dare seek revenge? Geary and Lord of Dale is dead, and I have eaten his people like a wolf among sheep, and where are his sons' sons that dare approach me? I kill where I wish, and none dare resist. I laid low the warriors of old, and their like is not in the world today. Then I was but young and tender. Now I am old and strong. 
Strong, strong thief in the shadows, he gloated. My armor is like tenfold shields, my teeth are swords, my claws spears, the shock of my tail a thunderbolt, my wings a hurricane, and my breath death. I have always understood, said Bilbo in a frightened squeak, that dragons were softer underneath, especially in the region of the uh, chest. Uh, but doubtless one so fortified has thought of that. The dragon stopped short in his boasting. Your information is antiquated, he snapped. I am armored above and below with iron scales and hard gems. No blade can pierce me. I might have guessed it, said Bilbo. Truly, there can be nowhere there, uh, there can nowhere be found the equal to a Lord Smog be impenetrable. What magnificence to possess a waistcoat of fine diamonds. Yes, it is a rare and wonderful indeed, said Smog, absurdly pleased. He did not know that the hobbit had already caught a glimpse of his peculiar undercovering on his previous visit and was itching for a closer view for reasons of his own. The dragon rolled over. Look, he said, what do you say to that? <laughs> Dazzlingly marvelous, perfect, flawless, staggering, exclaimed Bilbo aloud. But what he thought inside was, old fool, and there's a large patch in the hollow of his left breast, as bare as a snail out of its shell. After he'd seen that, Mr. Baggins' one idea was to get away. Well, I really must not detain your magnificence any longer, he said, or keep you from much needed rest. Ponies take some catching, I believe, after a long start, and so do burglars, he added as a parting shot as he darted back and fled up the tunnel. It was an unfortunate remark, for the dragon spouted terrific flames after him, and fast though he sped up the slope, he had not gone nearly far enough to be comfortable before the ghastly head of smog was thrust against the opening behind. Luckily, the whole head and jaws could not squeeze in, but the nostrils sent forth fire and vapor to pursue him, and he was nearly overcome and stumbled blindly on in great pain and fear. He had been feeling rather pleased with the cleverness of his conversation with Smog, but his mistake at the end shook him into better sense. Never laugh at live dragons, Bilbo, you fool, he said to himself, and it became a favorite saying of his later and passed into a proverb. You are nearly through this adventure yet, he asked, and that was pretty true as well. The afternoon was turning into evening when he came out again and stumbled and fell in a faint on the doorstep. The dwarves revived, revived him, and doctors to scorches as well as they could. But it was a long time before the hair on the back of his head and his heels grew properly again. It had all been singed and frizzled right down to the skin. And the meanwhile, his friends did their best to cheer him up. And they were eager for his story, especially wanting to know why the dragon had made such an awful noise and how Bilbo had escaped. But the hobbit was worried and uncomfortable, and they had difficulty in getting anything out of him. On thinking things over, he was now regretting some of the things he had said to the dragon, yeah. and was not eager to repeat them. <laughs> the old thrush was sitting on the rock nearby with his head cocked on one side, listening to all that was said. It shows what an ill temper Bilbo was in. He picked up a stone and threw it at the thrush, which oh. merely fluttered his eye and came back. Giraffe the bird, said Bilbo Crossby, crossly. I believe he is listening. I don't like the look of him. Leave him alone, said Thorin. The thrushes are good and friendly. This is a very old bird indeed, and it is maybe the last left of the ancient breed that used to live about here, tamed to the hands of my father and grandfather. They were long to live at magical rites, and this might even be one of those that were alive then couple of hundreds of years or more ago. The men of Dale used to have the trick of understanding their language, and use them for messengers to fly to the men of the lake and elsewhere. Well, he'll have news to take to the lake town all right, if that is what he is after, said Bilbo, though I don't suppose there's any, there are any people left there that trouble with thrush language. Why, what has happened, cried the dwarves. Do get on with your tail. So Bilbo told them all he could remember, and he confessed that he had a nasty feeling that the dragon guessed too much from his riddles added to the camps and ponies. I am sure he knows we came from Light Town and can help from there, and I have a horrible feeling that his next move may be in that direction. I wish to goodness I had never said that about Barrel Rider. I would make it, e uh, it would make even a blind rat in these parts think of the lake men. Well, well, it cannot be helped, and it is difficult not to slip in talking to a dragon, or so I have always heard, said Fallen, anxious to cover him. I think you did very well indeed, if you ask me. You found out one very useful thing at any rate, and got home alive. And that is more than most can say, who have had words with the likes of the small. Oh, it's the best. Yes. It may be a mercy and a blessing yet to know of the bare patch in the old worm's diamond waistcoat. That turned the conversation. And they all began discussing dragon slayings, historical, dubious, and mythical, and the various sorts of stabs and jabs and undercuts, 
and the different arts, arts devices, and stratagems by which they had been accomplished. The general opinion was that catching the dragon napping was not as easy as it sounded, and the attempt to stick one or prod one asleep was more likely to end in disaster than a full frontal attack. All the while they talked, the thrush listened, till at last when the stars began to peep forth, it silently spread its wings and flew away. And all the while they talked and the shattered shadows lengthened, Bilbo became more and more unhappy in his foreboding room. At last, he interrupted them. I am sure we are very unsafe here, he said, and I don't see the point of sitting here. The dragon has withered all the pleasant green, and anyway, the night has come and it is cold. But I feel it in my bones that this place will be attacked again. Spog knows now how I came down to his hall, and you can trust him to guess where the other end of the tunnel is. He will break all the side of the mountain to bits, if necessary, to stop up our entrance, and if we are smashed with it, the better he will like it. You are very gloomy, Mr. Baggins, said Thorin. <laughs> Why has not Smog blocked the lower end then if he is so eager to keep us out? He is not, or we should have heard him. I don't know, I don't know, because at first he wanted to try and lure me in again, I suppose. And now perhaps because he is waiting till after tonight's hunt, or because he does not want to damage his bedroom if he can help it. Yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but I wish you would not argue. Smog will be coming out at any minute now and our only hope is to get well in the tunnel and shut the door. He seemed so much in earnest that the dwarves at last did as he said, though they delayed shutting the door. It seemed a desperate plan, for no one knew whether or how they could get it open again from the inside, and the thought of being shut in a place from which the only way out led through the dragon's lair was not what they liked. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah that's pretty that's cool. legit. You need a fire exit. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, everything seemed quite quiet, both outside and down the tunnel. So for a longish while, I sat inside not far down from my half-open door and went on talking. The talk turned to the dragon's wicked words about the dwarves. Bilbo wished he had never heard them, or at least that he could feel quite certain that the dwarves now were absolutely honest when they declared that they had never thought at all about what would happen after the treasure had been won. We knew it would be a desperate venture, said Thorin, and we know that still, and I still think that we have won it. There will be time enough to think what to do about it. As for your share, Mr. Baggins, I assure you, we are more than grateful, and you shall choose your own four teeth as soon as we have anything to divide. I am sorry if you are worried about transport, and I admit the difficulties are great. The lands have not become less wild with the passing of time, rather the reverse. But we will do whatever we can for you, and take our share of the cost when the time comes. Believe me or not, as you like. From that talk, uh, from that, the talk turned to the great horde itself and to the things that Thorne and Balin remembered. Uh, they wondered if they were still lying there unharmed in the hall below. The spears that were made for the armies of the great king, Bladothan, uh, long since dead, each had a thrice forged head and their shafts were inlaid with cunning gold, but they were never delivered or paid for. Shields made for warriors long dead, the great golden cup of Thor, two handed, hammered, and carbon with birds and flowers whose eyes and petals were jewels. Uh, cos yes. Coats of mail uh, gilded and silver and impenetrable, the necklace of Agurion, Lord of Dale, made of five hundred emeralds, green as grass, which he gave for the army of his eldest son and a coat of dwarf linked rings, the like of which had never been made before, for it was brought of pure silver, silver to the power and strength of triple steel. But fairest of all was the great white gem, which the dwarves had found beneath the roots of the mountain, the heart of the mountain, the Arkenstone of Bran. The Arkenstone, sorry, three, three. Yeah. <laughs> the Arkenstone, the Arkenstone, muttered Thorin in the dark, half dreaming with his chin upon his knees. It was like a globe with a thousand facets. It shone like silver in the firelight, like water in the sun, like snow under the stars, like rain upon the moon. But the enchanted desire of the horde had fallen for Bilbo. All through their talk, he was only half listening to them. He sat nearest to the door with one ear cocked for any beginnings of a sound about. His other was alert for echoes beyond the murmurs of the dwarves, for any whisper of a movement, for a, a movement from far below. Darkness grew deeper, and he grew ever more uneasy. Shut the door, he begged them. I fear that dragon in my morrow. I like the silence far less than the uproar of last night. Shut the door before it is too late. 
Something in his voice gave the dwarves an uncomfortable feeling. Slowly, Thorin shook off his dreams and getting up, he kicked away the stone that went to the door. Then they thrust upon it and it closed with a snap and a clang. No trace of a keyhole was there left on the inside. They were shut in the mountain. And not a moment too soon. They had hardly gone any distance down the tunnel when a blow smote the side of the mountain like a crash of battering rams made of forest oaks and swung by giants. The rock boomed, the walls cracked, and stones fell from the roof on their heads. What would have happened if the door had still been open? I don't like to think. They fled further down the tunnel, glad to be still alive, while behind them outside they heard the roar and rubble of small furry. Fury. Fury. <laughs> I mean, he could be furry if he's a, if he's a cat. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> he was breaking rocks to pieces, smashing wall and cliff with the latchings of his huge tail, till the, their little lofty camping ground, the scorched grass, the freshest stone, the snail-covered walls, the narrow ledge, it all disappeared in a jumble of smithereens, and an avalanche of splintered stones fell over the cliff into the valley below. Smog had left his lair in silent stealth, quietly soared into the air, and then floated heavy and slow in the dark like a monstrous crow. <laughs> Down the wind toward the west of the mountain, in the hopes of catching unaware something or somebody there, and of spying the outlet to the passage which the thief had used. This was the outburst of his breath, and he could find nobody, and see nothing, even where he guessed the outlet must actually be. After he let him out off his rage in this way, he felt better, and he thought in his heart that he would not be troubled again from that direction. In the meanwhile, he had further vengeance to take. Barrel rider, he snorted. Your feet came from the water side. Up the water you came without a doubt. I don't know your smell, but if you are not one of those men of the lake, you have their help. They shall see me, and remember who is the real king under the mountain. He rose and fired, and went away south towards the running river. Not at home. In the meanwhile, the dwarves sat in darkness, and utter silence fell about them. Little they ate, and little they spoke. They could not count the passing of time, and they scarcely dared to move, for the whisper of their voices echoed and rustled in the tunnel. If they dozed, they woke still to darkness, and the silence going on unbroken. At last, after days and days of waiting, as it seemed, when they were becoming choked and dazed for want of air, they could bear it no longer. They would almost have welcomed sounds from below the dragon's return. In the silence, they feared some cunning devilry of his, but they could not sit there forever. Thorin spoke. Let us try the door, he said. I must feel the wind on my face or so soon or die. I think I would rather be smashed by smog in the open than suffocate in here. So several of the dwarves got up and groped back to where the door had been. But they found the upper end of the tunnel had been shattered and blocked with broken rock. Neither he nor the magic it had once obeyed would ever open that door again. We are trapped! They groaned. This is the end. We shall die here. But somehow, just when the dwarves were most despairing, Bilbo felt a strange lightening of the heart, as if a heavy weight had gone from under his waistcoat. Come, come, he said. While there's still life, there's hope as my father used to say, and third time pays for all. I am going down the tunnel once again. I have been that way twice when I knew there was a dragon at the other end, so I will risk a third visit when I am no longer sure. Anyway, the only way out is down, and I think this time you had better all come with me. In desperation, they agreed, and Thorn was the first to go forward by Bilbo's side. Now do be careful, whispered the hobbit, and as quiet as you can be. There may be no smog at the bottom, but then again, there may be. Don't let us take any unnecessary risks. Down, down they went. The dwarves could not, of course, compare with the Hobbit in real stealth, and they made a deal of puffing and shuffling with echoes magnifying alarmingly. But though every now and again Bilbo and Fear stopped and listened, not a sound stirred below. Near the bottom, as well as he could judge, Bilbo slipped off his ring and went ahead. But he did not need it. The darkness was complete, and they were all invisible, ring or no ring. In fact, so black with it that the hobbit came to the opening unexpectedly, put his hand on air, stumbling forward, and rolled headlong into the hall. <laughs> there he lay face downwards on the floor and did not dare to get up, or hardly even to breathe. 
But nothing moved. There was not a gleam of light, unless, as it seemed to him, when at last he slowly raised his head, there was a pale white glint above him and far off in the gloom. But certainly it was not a spark of dragon fire, though the warm stench was heavy in the place and the taste of vapor was on his tongue. At length, Mr. Baggins could bear it no longer. Confound you, small you worm, he squeaked aloud. Stop playing hide and seek. Give me a light and then eat me if you can catch me. <laughs> okay. Come at me, bro. <laughs> Faint echoes ran around the unseen hall, but there was no answer. Belbo got up and found that he did not know in what direction to turn. Now I wonder what on earth Smog is playing at, he said. He is not at home today, or tonight, or whatever it is. I do believe. If Owen and Glowen. Oin and Gloin. Oin and Gloin. That's so fun. Gloin is Gimli's dad. Aww. Oin and Gloin have not lost their tinder boxes. Perhaps we can make a little light and have a look around before the blood turns. Light, he cried, can anybody make a light? The dwarves, of course, were very alarmed when Bilbo fell forward down the step with a bump yeah. into the hall. So <laughs> and they sat huddled just where he had left them at the end of the tunnel. Shh, shh, they hissed when they heard his voice. And though that helped the hobbit to find out where they were, it was some time before he could get anything else out of them. But in the end, when Bilbo actually began to stamp on the floor and scream out, light! At the top of his shrill voice, Thorn gave way, and Oin and Gloin were sent back to their bundles at the top of the tunnel. Jeez, it's like a long way. I know. Why did you bring those down with you? You know the. It's fine. <laughs> you know, they don't think anything through. Let's be honest. Yeah, too. yeah. To be fair, a lot of this is like, oh, getting it back. Didn't think about that. Oh, so how, how do we deal with the dragons? <laughs> we'll figure that out when it comes to it. <laughs> Fake it till you make it. Huh. Yeah, luckily they don't even have to kill the dragon. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> after, <laughs> after a while, a twinkling gleam showed them returning, Oin with a small pine torch alight in his hand, and glowing with a bundle of others under his arm. Quickly, Bilbo trotted to the door and took the torch, but he could not persuade the dwarves to light the others or to come and join him yet. As Thorin carefully explained, Mr. Baggins was still officially their expert burglar and investigator. If he liked to risk a light, that was his affair. But he would wait in the tunnel for his report. I'll just hang out here. Yes. You, you, you go do this. You have fun. <laughs> so they sat near the door and watched. They saw the little dark shape of the hobbit start across the floor, holding his tiny light aloft. Every now and again, Mom was still near enough, they caught a glimpse and a tinkle as he stumbled on some golden thing. The light grew smaller as he wandered away into the vast hall. Then it began to rise, dancing into the air. Bilbo was climbing the great mound of treasure. Soon he stood upon the top and still went on. Then they saw him halt and stoop for a moment, but they did not know the reason. It was the Arkham Stone, the heart of the mountain. So Bilbo guessed Thorin's description. But indeed, there could not be two such gems, even in so marvelous a forward, even in all the world. Ever as he climbed, the same white gleam had shone before him and drawn his feet towards it. Slowly, it grew to a little globe of pallid light. Now, as he came near it, it was tinged with a flickering sparkle of many colors at the surface, reflected and splintered from the wavering light of his torch. At last, he looked down upon it, and he caught his breath. The great jewel shone before his feet of its own inner light, and yet, cut and fashioned by the dwarves who had dug it from the heart of the mountain long ago, it took all light that fell upon it and changed it into 10,000 sparks of white radiance shot with glints of the rainbow. Suddenly, Bilbo's arm went towards it, drawn by its enchantment. His small hand would not close about it, for it was a large and heavy gem. But he lifted it, shut his eyes, and put it in his deepest pocket. Now I am a burglar indeed, thought he, but I suppose I must tell the dwarves about it. Sometime. You know, it's a point time. <laughs> <laughs> they did say I could pick and choose my own share. Oh god, the one's not going to be having uh, no. <laughs> that. And I think I would choose this if they took all the rest. All the same, he had a comfortable feeling that the picking and choosing had not really been meant to include this marvelous gem, and that trouble would yet come of it. Now he went on again. Down the other side of the great mound he climbed, and the spark of his torch vanished from the sight of the watching dwarves. 
but soon they saw it far away in the distance again. Bilbo was crossing the floor of the hall. He went up until he came to the great doors of the furthest side, and there a draught of air refreshed him, but it almost poked out his light. He peeped timidly through and caught a glimpse of great passages and of the dim beginnings of a wide stairs going up into the gloom. And still there was no sight nor sound of smog. He was just going to turn and go back when a black shape swooped at him and brushed his face. He squeaked and started, stumbled backwards and fell. His torch dropped head downwards and went out. Only a bat, I suppose, and hope, he said miserably. But now what am I to do? Which is east, south, north, or west? Thorin, Fallen, Oin, Loin, Hilly, Hilly, he cried as loud as he could. It seemed a thin little noise in the wide blackness. I might be a good place to stop. <laughs> Just like, you know, you know he's, he's lost. lost. He's, so, yeah. he's alone. But he's got the Ark and Stone. He's got the Ark and Stone. And the dwarves don't know that he has the Ark and Stone. And what could possibly go wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> well, they don't know on her them. Surely. Maybe. Surely, yeah, you know. And where has Smog gone? That's, I don't know. Problematic, huh? He's not here. And join us next Monday at 1.30 Central Time for the continuation to find out where Smog went. Which is a very worrisome sentence to say. I'm Anne. I'm Megan. And thanks so much for joining us. Bye. Bye.